Hello everyone and welcome to episode 12 of SSTO Space Program. Today we are launching an absolutely massive ship to Jewel because, as expressed by more than 40 of you, we will be building an outpost on Pole. It could have been smaller probably, but it seems like I'm incapable of making small ships, that's one thing. And also, I wanted our refueling station and surface greenhouse to have some useful throughput. On top of that, I thought that since we are launching that much already, we can also send a bunch of science satellites to explore the Julian system, and we also need the lander. When all of that was ready, I realized that the transfer stage is already large enough that it might as well become a colony ship slash space station. At this point, adding plus or minus 50 tons of the payload doesn't matter that much, you know how it is. So we ended up with a colony ship that, with everything included, weighs around 600 tons. We will launch everything in two launches, or three if you want to be very precise. The first part you see right here is the heaviest and by far the largest payload we're going to put in orbit using the OCOD2 SSTO launch vehicle. The colony ship itself, which is the payload, weighs 440 tons exactly and is so large that our SSTO has actually become pointy again. Since this part of our mission to Joule is basically orbital deployment and assembly, I thought music format would suit it better, so I made it a bit more cinematic and I'll let you enjoy the video and the music. Once our vessel is in orbit, I'll talk a little bit about the features of our ship. But for now, enjoy!
With the SSTO space plane docked to our mothership, we are now ready for Trans Julian injection burn. We are a couple of days late, but with the large gravitational well Jew has, it doesn't matter that much. Our launch was late due to financial reasons. I had to finish a couple of contracts and call a few important Kerbals and convince them to lend us some money to make this mission possible. Nevertheless, our vessel is now in orbit and ready for action. The burn was executed in many, many passes, as we have a puny 1.2 meter per second square acceleration when fully fueled, and we need to eject at almost 2 kilometers per second from Kerbin to reach Joule. After approximately 6 passes, we finally had an encounter with Joule, and as our vessel is leaving Kerbin's sphere of influence, we can now have a closer look at what we have brought with us. The large vehicle you see in the front is our mining slash refueling rover, equipped with two large drills and ISRU, capable of not only relatively quick refueling even of larger ships, but is also suited for autonomous operation. It is equipped with a claw, so it can dock to any vessel, and since it has wheels, we can drive it on the surface to either look for most abandoned ore deposits or facilitate refueling of other ships. It has hybrid solar fuel cell power supply, so it can operate all the time and is also full stock. Next, we have six science satellites. Five of them are exactly the same and will be put around each of Jules' moons. They are equipped with science instruments, a resource scanner and scansat biomes and SAR scanners. We will use them to get important information about the makeup of all Julian moons to help us pinpoint best spots for future colonies. The sixth satellite is a bit different and will orbit Jules itself we will put it in an eccentric polar orbit over Joule once we get there, and I'm sure that um, you have noticed it is a bit similar to Juno spacecraft. This is intentional, and I hope that it will become even clearer once our solar panels are deployed. I wanted to use this spacecraft as an excuse to talk a little bit about Juno mission in the future. Then there is our pole greenhouse, fully automated, with very high throughput, capable of producing fertilizer in situ, either from gypsum or from minerals. We only need to supply it with mulch, but I bet our Kerbals will have plenty of that once we arrive. It is powered by a nuclear reactor and has ample storage space for supplies and all minerals and products it will produce. Just like the mining rover, it is designed to land on pole on its own and has a docking port just in case we wanted to expand it into a full-fledged base in the future. Now, the main part of our ship that will become an orbital station slash mothership for our first dual missions consists of a Kerbitab, a medbay in case something bad happens to our Kerbals, an agricultural support module and some greenhouses and extensive light support and recycling system. All that combined with resources we brought from Kevin will ensure that our team will make it in one piece to Jewel. We also have plenty of living space on the ship, but we're taking only seven Kerbals with us. Some scientists, engineer, a colonist and a pilot. Our crew should be safe, but if anything goes wrong, there are also cryopods for every single one of them, where they can stay and wait to be rescued. We also have a science lab for processing all the science data we will be getting at Joule. The ship has a hybrid solar nuclear power generation system and should be fine, even if we run out of enriched uranium eventually. This vessel, with the payload it is carrying now, has over 3.5 km per second delta V and without the payload and fully fueled, has over 5 km per second. Two round tanks you see right now can hold over 40,000 units of liquid fuel, with nine extra Mark I fuel tanks holding 400 units each. The array of nine NERV nuclear rocket motors is going to be the main propulsion system for this beast. That is not all, however. To maintain connection between surface bases on Pole and other moons eventually, we have a small supply lander suited for non-atmospheric bodies. Initially, it is designed to carry only supplies and mulch, but two side tanks can be refitted for other goods too. It should be capable of landing on Paul, Bob and Val with varying cargo payload. Last but not least, we have a medium-sized Mark II Science SSTO that can be used as a lander on any of those bodies, with the exception of Tylo. It was meant to be a lathe lander, but could fit any other role just as well, and probably serve as a fast transport ship around the dual system as well. It has enough Delta V when full to also go back to Kerbin, if at any point that would be necessary. 
Once every module on our ship was activated, every habitat was running, power generation was in place, purifiers were purifying, life support modules were supporting life, and in short everything was up and running, it turned out that our crew could stay in the ship for about 16 years before experiencing any problem, and 22 years before they actually became homesick. With that in mind, and knowing that it's way more than we need to make a round trip to Jewel, I think we're good. Now, as our Jewel colony ship is leaving Kerbin's sphere of influence at almost 4 km per second, I would like to thank you very much for watching and I hope that you've enjoyed. And if you did, please consider giving this video a like. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them in the comments section below. Our brave team embarks on an epic journey and we can only hope that they are well prepared. They will arrive at Jewel in about 3 years. And in the meantime, we still have a lot to do on Manman Minmus. But until then, I'm Mark Frim and I'll see you next time. Cheers!